there's the difference between a tactic and like a strategy. You know what I mean? And so like a strategy to me is something that's like bigger picture. It's not like um, it's overall like, okay, we're going to focus on our brand. Hello, fabulous person. Beata Shalet here, the growth architect. Welcome back to the Business Growth Architect Show where we bring you cutting edge business strategies from some of the world's most successful entrepreneurs, business transformation experts and visionaries who want to help you to scale your impact. Look for one tangible strategy that you can take back and implement right away. And now back to our guest. Hello and welcome back. This is Beata Shillette, your host for the Business Growth Architect Show. And today I have an awesome, awesome, awesome guest who will tell you about um, making money online, Amazon, Walmart specifically. So Fernando, welcome to the show. Why don't you go ahead and tell us why you are so special and everything we need to know about you. Thanks so much for having me, Beata. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Really excited for the conversation today. Um, yeah, I mean, a little bit about, uh, I guess, us. Yeah, I mean, um, my background, I came from tech, uh, basically started staying on Amazon uh, back in 2014 with one of my best friends. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a wild ride, and we were talking a little bit about the show. But, you know, naturally, there's a lot of the ups and downs with entrepreneurship. But yeah, I mean, we started selling home and kitchen items sourced from China um, and kind of more private label brands, getting them to rank on Amazon. We built like you know a really large business between about thirty to thirty-five million a year. Um, we've now sold a lot of those assets, which has been fun. We've started software companies within the space, but now um, and, and sold those as well. Uh, but now what we're really focused on is like a agency where we work with other like consumer product brands or CPG brands, helping them scale mostly on Amazon, and Walmart. Um, yeah, now we've got like give or take probably around like 30 plus clients. We manage about 50 million a year in revenue. Um, we've got an amazing team of about 70 people. Um, but yeah, I, I love talking business strategy and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, excited. Excellent. So let's dive in. So looking at the work that you do, what does strategy mean for you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think what we talk about internally a lot of the time is like, there's the difference between a tactic and like a strategy, you know what I mean? And so like a strategy to me is something that's like kind of like bigger picture. It's not like um, it's overall like, okay, we're going to focus on our brand where they're like, you know, as like a, a bigger overarching thing where a tactic might be uh, something that is just kind of usually more like short term and doesn't necessarily, isn't going to be necessarily repeatable. It might be like, okay, we're going to use a, a, a bot for this, or we're going to do, it's kind of more short-term focus, where I think like a strategy um, to me might be like, okay, we're going to uh, really focus on this for like one, this one thing for a long period of time, and it's going to build us like a moat. So, you know, maybe it's like investing, uh, you know, something maybe like, a tactic would be like, uh, for instance, like, okay, we're going to work with a bunch of influencers, like in the short term, but like a strategy to me is like, okay, we're going to hire like a VP of marketing or a CMO that's come from a company that's already been like already been there, already scaled to eight figures, nine figures, whatever. Um, and, and has that experience. And so it's, it's a little bit more, I guess, secure and well thought out in my experience versus like a tactic is kind of usually more like short term thinking. I like that a lot, you know, uh, and, and for those of you who are listening to this, you know, this is kind of like really important because I think a lot of times people mistake strategies for initiatives or as you call them tactics, right? And mm -hmm. so it's like, well, I have an idea and let's try that. And if it doesn't work, then we'll do something else. That's a gimmick, a you know, that's a tactic. That's, that's, that's something short term. A strategy is something where you, where you really plan something out on a much more long-term basis and you put more resources behind it or you give it a little bit more time because a strategy, sometimes strategies work off very quickly. Sometimes strategies take, take a little bit of time. So thank you for that differentiation. I thought that was really good. Um, I haven't heard anybody say tactic, but I, I think I know, I know exactly where you're coming from. Very good, very good point. So let's talk about what is your favorite strategy because 
you must have many of them doing what you do. Yeah, um, there's so many. Uh, I would say, if I were to think about it in an overarching thing, I, I would say it's, you know, getting the, uh, you know, getting advice from people more experienced than me. You know, I think, uh, you know, in the beginning, in the early days, you're the CEO, you, you feel like, okay, I should know this the best. And I think um, one of the things that we heard early on that like, we always remind ourselves is like, you don't know what you don't know. And it's one of those like important things that you kind of hear. Uh, and so I think it's kind of getting over that, you know, ego or, you know, to ask, about asking for help. And so and this can come in like, uh, you know, in the form of many different ways. So I think one is like hiring people with more experience that I've already done, like I've already gotten to where you're trying to be and getting those people on your team. I think you can bring on consultants like CEO coaches, business coaches. Um, that's incredibly helpful. I would say like advisors are also really helpful because they have like the luxury of seeing, you know, several different companies, whether it's an investor or like just like an advisor for a specific area of your business. But all of them can help so much in terms of making less mistakes, providing kind of like industry benchmarks, making the right introductions. And I think if there's like one like overarching thing, I would think I would just say it's like don't go about it alone. Like people are generally really excited to help entrepreneurs in that kind of like early, especially in the early stages. Uh, and so I would say it's kind of getting over that probably and, and you know asking for help would be my like one like bigger strategy problem that's so interesting so i think there's a there's a couple of things that are in there so number one i think you're absolutely right there's the ego of the owner where mm -hmm. you know in 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 business growth architecture what we talk about we call this you are absolutely forbidden to do mini me cloning as a strategy because that's a lot of business owners do that. They say, oh, if I only had three more people that were just like me. And I'm like, no, no, that's a terrible idea because then you're going to get the same result and you're all going to be crazy because you need to have an organizational chart and then, you know, find people that are better at certain things, which, which is what I'm hearing you say. So number one, get over the ego that you have to know and be everything. How do you how do you shift out of that though as a business owner? Like, what do you tell your clients when they come to you and they say, "But Fernando, I am really the best at everything." Okay, let's face it. I, I set up this company; it's all my idea. What do you tell them? Other than they're full of <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I don't face it as much with our clients. I mean, I, I think you know more friends, like you know, that might come to me. Uh, for advice and then you know I'll usually kind of just like ask a lot of questions you know I, I think what I've realized over the years is if you tell people what to do it doesn't work as well my fiance is um <laughs> is living proof of <laughs> that uh, yeah, right, right now. Um, but I would say you know I think usually the, like, what I found is just asking more mm -hmm. questions will usually get people to see it on their own but it's like okay, well, like, what are your goals? You know what I mean? And then kind of like figuring like, well, how many hours do you want to work a week? Like, is, is this like current strategy helping you get to those goals and those hours per week? And I think people will quickly realize like, yeah, trying to do everything isn't scalable. And it's just, it's a lot of unnecessary stress. And so I think it really kind of, yeah, maybe part two then is, is like hiring the right people, putting the right people in the right seats that you're going to be excited to delegate those things too. Because I know a lot, like pretty much everybody on our team, like I'm excited to give them the work because honestly, they're going to do a better job. Like they have more time, they're more focused, they're more specialized than I am. And so I think, it, you know, often it comes down to, you know, prioritizing the right things, but then also hiring the right people so that, um, the, and those things in tandem really lead to like, um, to getting stuff done and not getting burnt out. Yes. And that was the second thing that is the avoidance of the burnout. Um, I, and you, 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 you jumped, you jumped right ahead to that. So I think that that's an important thing uh, to mention. And then the third part about this 
is so we we got the ego, we got the time and the value of time and money. And then thirdly, you know, now talking really about money. What do you say to somebody who says, but I can't afford someone quite yet that are at that threshold of where their old mindset just keeps pulling them back in the abyss, but they kind of see it. So, so how do you help them to push them over that ledge to their own success? Yeah, it's a great question. So if they can't afford the right person yet, um, I, I would probably, I, I would first maybe just start with like, okay, well, like at, at what point, like what at point does it make sense? So just kind of making sure that like we've kind of figured out the numbers. So it's like, okay, well, how much is that right person going to cost? Like, where are you at right now? Like at, at what point? Kind of just getting like, is there like a metric? Like, okay, we want to be at X in profit per month uh, where I feel safe to make that higher. But I guess just kind of creating more of a plan around it uh, would be probably the, the first part that I would go to. Um, but and then just trying to figure out, well, is there other creative ways that we can get that person on before? Like maybe they would be start part-time or maybe uh, for the right person, you like give up some equity to, to bring them on earlier. But like, we know that their payback is like, you know, let's say we give them 5% equity, but it's like, can they generate, like they increase the value of the business by more than 5%, things like that, that I would be kind of thinking about or, um, or yeah, maybe uh, extending your, like your free time by like maybe hiring a team overseas in the short term that allows you to amplify certain areas, like maybe some like lead gen or like sales efforts, marketing efforts to get you to a place where you can now make that, um, that really crucial hire. Things like that, that I would be kind of, I guess, brainstorming around and seeing, um, like, I guess, if, if this if this role is really a priority, then it's like, what can we do with what you have right now to get to that place sooner? Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Um, that brings me to my next question, Fernando. So now we are at this uh, question of what's more important, impact or money? And what drives you? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I really believe in, in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so I, I think it changes over time. I think, um, you know, in the beginning for a lot of entrepreneurs, myself included, um, I didn't have as much luxury to worry about impact, you know what I mean? Because you're just trying Gotta to pay cover. the bills. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're covering rent, right? And like, you know, in, in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, I left a really great paying job, like well into the six figures. And it's like, impact would be awesome. But like, honestly, I just don't want to fail. I don't want to be broke. Like, I don't want to move in with my mom. You know what I mean? Like, there's like, you have like all these kind of things kind of going through your mind. Um, I think, yeah, as, as things change and then you have more savings, uh, I do think impact becomes more important. Uh, now I I care a lot more about like the employees, like and thinking about like okay, well, how can we make it a better, um, you know, a, a better experience for them? How can we create generational wealth for them as well? Like how can we do all these other things um, that yeah weren't honestly as much of a priority uh, right in the beginning because yeah we're just trying to figure it out. Uh, but I mean, I do think that's like one of the amazing things about entrepreneurship is like that you, as you're able to like meet, I guess, some of those like lower level needs or like the first things that you kind of accomplish, then it kind of gives you the space to think about like other exciting things. Like, I mean, I, I heard this guy, um, David Osborne speak a long time ago and he, he's done extremely well. And I think one of the things that stood out is like, yeah, in the beginning, he was really focused on like houses and, you know, all the normal like monetary things. But then he kind of set up a cool, new, interesting KPI for himself. One was like a certain number of like daddy daughter dates that he would have per year with his daughter. Um, another one was that he wanted a certain amount of his direct reports to make over a million a year. I think it was five per year uh, or sorry, like five people to make over a million dollars a year that worked for him. And it's just like things like that that I thought were were pretty interesting that you don't necessarily always hear about. 
folks who are focused on like revenue and valuations and things like that. Um, but yeah, I think you can have like a lot of cool ways of making the impact for a broader number of people as, as time goes on. I love the KPA of father-daughter dates. <laughs> yeah. I don't think ever I have heard of a KPI, a key performance indicator that measures the success of a business owner by the number of uh, daddy-daughter dates. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, I'll be using that. That's, <laughs> that's, that's really good. I like this a very honest answer um, to say, and I think it's important to point this out. Because I'm definitely impact driven, but I built and sold a business to Bill Gates. So, you know, I have money in the bank. It's much easier. <laughs> you, you're absolutely correct. To think about the impact that you're making is much easier when you have that. Right. Can you think about an impact when you're not making money yourself? I think now that you said that, I have like this like little twitch in the back of my brain where it goes like, well, that's exactly the point. Because when people are then focusing on making an impact too early on without paying their own bills, then they're becoming almost like slaves to their business because mm -hmm. then they're, you know, they're doing all these things and giving all these things away, but they're not taking care of themselves. So that I think is that is a huge, is a huge danger when we think about impact versus, versus money. I like that a lot. So make the money first, listen to Fernando, get your, get, get your bills paid. And then there is a gradual change on where you want to make a bigger and bigger impact because then it goes into the legacy you want to leave behind because then money isn't what you worry about anymore. Then, then the meaning kind of becomes more important. So great stuff. That brings me to my next question. So when I was looking at some of the stuff that you're posting online, I couldn't help but find a whole bunch of values on your <laughs> website. Yeah. and extreme ownership, use good judgment, be 1% better every day. It sounds to me, number one, like you read a lot of business books, you probably listen to a ton of podcasts. So tell us what, what are these values about? Where's it coming from? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And so I think, yeah, maybe to, to add some more context. So um, my business partner and I created our original set of values, not these ones. We just announced these ones maybe a few months ago. Uh, when we originally did it, it was just the two of us. I don't even know if we had employees at the time, but we just kind of sat down like at you know one of our apartments, just kind of thinking about, you know, what should the company look like when we have employees, right? And we just kind of balance ideas off each other. Um, but now like the new ones that we just released were based on now, yeah, having give or take their own seven employees. We've now like worked with you know a lot of these employees for five plus years, and so we just have like a lot better like uh, I guess pulse on like what makes a great employee. What are the expectations that we have for everybody that works here? And so yeah, I mean we took a lot of our favorite phrases and inspiration from like from just different um, different employees, different like books that we've read. Like extreme ownership is from Jocko, uh, yeah, really famous, um, kind of more, yeah, I guess like influential, like business guy. And he just talks about like, you know, having like a, a ton of ownership over every area of your life. And and naturally, like those are our favorite people to work with, right? And it's like the people that you just know, like kind of to the point earlier, it's like, we know that if we, like, we ask them to do something, they're going to get it done well. Like, we don't have to really review it. Like, we don't have to follow up. Like, those are like the best types of colleagues. And so we wanted to make sure that I was there. Um, we borrow a ton of inspiration from Netflix as well. And so a lot of them are also kind of like modeled off of um, Netflix and just like how they don't refer to themselves as like, um, you know, a family, but instead they kind of, you know, align themselves more to like, you know, working at Netflix is like being like on a professional sports team, which I, I love that analogy. And it's like, you know, the, the concept that you have to keep you know, like getting better, reading, like um, trying to think about not being stuck in the status quo and like thinking about it in that respect is kind of the energy that we want someone to, to come into our business as. And so, yeah, I mean, I think we, we take a little bit of inspiration um, from, from different areas and we just kind of figured out, yeah, okay, what does this look like working here? And then just getting a lot of feedback from the employees and colleagues and just kind of, you know, solidifying into that. 
Yes, I you you just said something that really stuck with me. I think the one of the important things to point out for our audience is that these values really aren't something that you decide because you're bored when you're sitting somewhere in Bora Bora drinking Mai Tais. And uh, you, 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 you feel like you need to come up with something amazing where everybody goes like, whoa, dude, that guy's so cool, look at that. But that it is about a business owner as you grow, who looks at how do I make people not just show up for work, but how do I make people buy into what we said we want to achieve? And that's the ownership. The ownership is not, I just work here. I think the first time, and I'm original from Germany, the first time I ever heard that when I walked into, I think I walked into a department store at the time and I was asking a simple question. I said, uh, do you have these pants in a different size? And she says, I don't know, I just work here. Oh, wow. That's funny. And, and, and that was the first time I heard that. And I thought, how disconnected must you be to think that when you work in a, in a clothing store, not to know what sizes there are, that that's not even part of your job. I mean, that went even beyond me. But I think that, the, that this, what, what it goes to, and I don't really talk about this very often in this show, but how these values are your desire to share what you are passionate about and instill some of this, you know, into, into your employees. I mean, am I getting this correctly? I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that's kind yeah. of, but it stuck out so much when I saw it. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. I, I love that. And now I think the way that you put it is, is, uh, it is totally spot on. I think the way that we, when we were thinking about it, as we were writing it is that like, okay, you know, my partner and I can't be in every meeting, right? And it's, it's not a good use of time. And so it's thinking about like, okay, it, it, ideally these values will basically create a framework for how people act when we're not in the room. And then it's like, and it's just thinking, and it's, and they should be clear enough so that you can actually, you know, give people constructive feedback based on these. And so then now they're more, integrated as part of our performance reviews and things like that and so that it's very clear like what you're working on like if you're um if you're complimenting someone you like we try to use it so that it's like you're bringing up a value and it's like if you're giving someone like you know maybe uh, a performance improvement plan or whatever it's again we're tying into a value and it's like hey here's where you're kind of at here's what we want to see like here's examples based on these values and so that's kind of the way that we we've tried to implement it and we continue to do so I love that framework, how people act when you are not in the room. That I think just about sums it up on what this is all about, to give them that guideline, that North Star, that they always know where that, where that, where that is going to be. I love it. Well, uh, time just flies when I'm talking to you. So tell us, <laughs> how can anyone who's heard you now say, I need to know more about Marketplace Ops and I need to know more about Fernando and what he does, where should we send them? Yeah, uh, well, I'm really active on LinkedIn, so uh, you can find me there, Fernando Campos, or if you ever have any questions about Amazon or like consumer brands, anything like that. Um, yeah, we, we release a ton of content on marketplaceops.com, uh, and then you can always reach out there, and we're always happy to chat. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, for, for being here. This was awesome. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you and what you do in the world of entrepreneurship. And there you have it all. This is Fernando Campos for you. And I am your host, Beata Chalet. And thank you for watching and listening to another episode of the Business Growth Architect Show. And that's it for us today. Thank you for listening and watching the Business Growth Architect Show. I enjoyed having you here. And for accountability, just take one of the strategies that you have heard, one thing that you can implement in your business immediately. Please leave comments. Don't forget to like and share this show. And if you have any questions about business, please put them in the comments. We are here for you. We're here to support you and help you to grow, build and scale your own business. For more advice, please check out our website in the show notes below. Thank you again. This is Beat Chalet, the Growth Architect, and goodbye.